We see Jesus come to us today in our gospel lesson from the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works of God requires? And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Every man dies but not every man really lives. So said William Wallace in the movie Braveheart. And this week, as I studied our gospel lesson from the sixth chapter of the book of John, I realized something. Because when I heard the words of Jesus, I am the bread of life, I had always turned my attention to the word bread. That's not a bad thing. I mean, in this chapter of the Bible, Jesus refers to himself as bread three times. And that's not insignificant. But as I studied and I read and I listened to others preach on this text, I became became drawn to two other words that Jesus spoke of life. Jesus calls himself the bread of life. So what does that mean? What is, what is Jesus talking about when he speaks about life? And I mean, on the one hand, we have our scientific, biological definition of life, an entity that is organic, having the capacity for growth, reproduction, functional activity, and continual change preceding death. But is this what Jesus is referring to when he talks about life? I have my doubts. Because I think Jesus is going deeper. Much deeper. And one could also argue that Jesus is talking about eternal life, life after death, the escape of this veil of tears, so to speak. But I also have my doubts about this. Because following Jesus isn't simply about pie in the sky by and by. Following Jesus includes eternal life, but it is not limited to eternal life. Christianity encompasses our lives right here and right now. Now. So given that, what does it mean to live? Especially since Jesus will say just a little bit later in John 10, chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. What is abundant life? And if we were to ask maybe a hundred people here in the U.S. and ask them what an abundant life was, we would probably get an answer something like this. To be able to do what we want, when we want, and how we want. Essentially, to be free from obligation, to have no one telling us what to do and when to do it. To be financially secure. 
to be free from anything that would restrict our wants and our desires. And arguably, this is what we all want. To really live might be able, mean that we would to achieve at some point in time this kind of deal. And I'm not excluding myself from this, by the way. Not at all. See, last week I received a phone call while we were in the post office mailing off those boxes for the 8th Infantry. Looked at the caller ID. It said Portico Benefits. Now that's the company that manages my retirement benefits and my health benefits. And they've never called me. So I'm a little bit worried. I answer the phone. Sweet lady on the other end of the line And uh, she said something that at first was a bit upsetting, and then it was also a bit thought-provoking. I'll give you the upsetting part first. You know, the, the sweet lady kindly said, Hello, Pastor. Hope you're doing well. We know that you just turned 50. That's a great way to start a conversation, isn't it? Remind a person that they're getting old. But then her next words were this. Have you started thinking about retirement? And I had to tamp down the urge to say, you know, lady, I've been thinking about retirement for the last 20 years. (laughs) Because you see, I too dream of the time when there are fewer obligations on my life. Not that I don't love what I do. I do. I really do. But like many of you, I long for more freedom to do what I want to do when I want to do it, and how I want to do it. But is that really living? And can we actually achieve such a life? Or is there something more? Is Jesus hinting at something more fundamental? Is there a different way of living, a different mindset that opens up a reality for us, a different path that we can walk, a path where he is the bread of life, a life that is truly full of satisfaction and fulfillment, a life that is truly worth living. Let's turn to our text and see, and as we do so, let's set the stage for this interchange between Jesus and the crowd. And, and we need to understand that this is a part of the crowd that had been fed by Jesus by the five loaves of bread and two fish. That's the story that Pastor Casey preached on last week. And while Jesus preached long sermons, we're a bit more limited time-wise these days. So Pastor Casey didn't have enough time to hit on every point of that text last week. And there was a very important statement at the end of that text where the crowd was seeking to make Jesus king. And so Jesus, knowing this, left and went to a deserted place. And what's important is realizing why the people wanted to make Jesus king. You see, they believed that he was at the very least a very powerful prophet or judge who would bring about freedom and prosperity for the people of Israel. Jesus would be the means to usher in these things for their benefit. And so as such, they wanted the things that Jesus could bring them, but they didn't necessarily want Jesus. And so knowing this, knowing their hearts and expectations, Jesus left them. But there was a good chunk of that crowd that was not going to be dissuaded so easily. They were going to track Jesus down, and so they did. They managed to find some boats there next to the Sea of Galilee, and they sailed across the sea to Capernaum, and they found Jesus and his disciples. And that's where our text begins. And the the opening statement, there's a very interesting statement, because the crowd looks at Jesus and says, hey, when did you get here? So the question actually stems from a part of the story that we skipped, And and that's a part of the story where Jesus walked on water uh, over the Sea of Galilee to the other side. And so if you want to catch up on that part and understand all of that, please go back and read John chapter 6 a little bit later. But for now, know that that opening question stems from those events. But Jesus ignores their question. He ignores it completely because he knows their hearts. Jesus knows why they are really there. Because their thoughts are focused entirely on worldly power and freedom. 
And so Jesus says to them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. So in other words, when you ate of those loaves and fishes, you saw me as someone who could fill your stomachs. You only saw me as someone of great power who could be your king and throw off earthly oppressors. You only saw me as a means to fulfill your selfish desires. You didn't see that miracle as a revelation of who I am. You didn't see that miracle as a sign that I am God incarnate who has come to earth. You've totally missed the mark. And so Jesus tries to help them hit the mark. Jesus tries to lay it all out them. And he says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. So we could actually spend an awfully long time unpacking this statement and go into detail, but we're not. We're just going to hit it briefly and then circle back to its main points. See, Jesus indicates that there are two types of food. There's a perishable food, which is kind of earthly stuff, and it, well, perishes. And then there's an imperishable food, and this is eternal food. And one of those types of food you work for, and the other type is given to you. So let that sink in for just a second. Perishable food you work for, but imperishable food, that's given to you. And it's given to you by the Son of Man on whom God the Father has set his seal. And I think that little detail might there, right there might be a little difficult for us to understand these days. But back in the ancient East, when a king set his seal upon something or gave his seal to someone, then that document carried the authority and status and weight of the king. That person carried the same status, authority, and power of the king. So Jesus is stating here that he has the exact same status, power, and authority as God the Father. That's an astounding statement. And the crowd completely misses it. They absolutely miss it. Because they look at Jesus and say, what must we do to perform the works of God? Somehow they focus on work only and not the rest of what Jesus says. You see, Jesus is trying to get them to focus on him, but they want to focus on everything but him. And doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound like kind of how our lives tend to work out? Doesn't Jesus tend to get lost in all the furious running around that we do? Doesn't Jesus get lost in all the political discourse and hand-wringing that we do? Doesn't Jesus get lost in all of the things that we decide that we have to do right now? And I know sometimes we like to give it a God sugar coating. Oh yeah, God wants us to vote for this candidate and God wants us to do all these things and God wants us to make his kingdom come, but the focus is on us. It's not really on God. But Jesus tries to bring it back to him. You want to know what the work of God is? The work of God that you, is, you do is to believe in him whom he has sent. That's the work of God. And you can substitute the word trust for the word believe in that statement, and it likely, likely captures the translation a little bit better. Trust in Jesus. You know, that's the key. Orient your life around Jesus. That's the key. Everything else will fall into place. Trust in Jesus. But the crowd's a bit skeptical about that. They're not sold on that idea. Jesus is actually questioning their beliefs. He's questioning their worldview. He is shaking the foundations of what they believed God wanted. And so therefore, they begin to demand a sign from him. So that's, that's confirmation that they didn't see the feeding of the 5,000 as a sign because they want, they want something bigger. They want something better. They want to see something greater than what Moses did with their ancestors in the wilderness when God provided manna from heaven. And Jesus gently reminds them then. He says, you know, wait, wait a minute here. It was God who gave you that manna. And he says, very truly, I tell you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, 
But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven, for the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So Jesus, in the midst of that statement, makes a couple of startling claims. One, that God is his Father, and that two, God is the one who brings a bread that literally gives life to the world. And again, as we saw earlier, it's a bread that does not perish. It lasts eternally. And it's not linked to earthly power or political might. It's got to be something marvelous. It's got to be something greater than anything known to humankind. And at that point, the crowd gets it. They get it. Because they're like, Jesus, give us this bread always. They know this bread is awesome. They want it. They long for it. But (laughs) they don't quite get it. They just don't quite get it. And so Jesus tells them, it's me. I'm that bread. I am the bread of life. Have your life revolve around me and you'll never be hungry. A life worth living is a life that has Jesus at the center of it. That's Jesus' message for us today. And that's such a stark contrast as what I outlined earlier about how we might define really living. Remember the definition that I said, you know, to be able to do what we want, when we want, and how we want. So in that case, who is at the center of our perceived good life? Who does the world revolve around? Us. Individually, it would be the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I. I want to be in charge. I want to call the shots. I don't want anything limiting me or my freedom. But is this life even attainable? Is there really a time in this world where we can be at the center of our own proverbial universe? And you already know the answer to that. I already know the answer to that. We know the answer is no. No, it's never going to happen. We will always bump up against limitations. Our government imposes certain demands on us with laws and taxes. We live in relationship with other people, and we cannot simply demand that everybody do what we tell them to do. We're limited by the laws of physics and by biology. I mean, our bodies get older and decline. Our strength fades, and then we bump up against the final limiting factor, the factor that each and every one of us has to face, and that's death. We all die, and that hovers over us all. There's never a time where we will be able to do what we want, when we want, and how we want. If this is our definition of really living, we will never experience it. And is it any wonder why there are so many people who are so frustrated? But what if there is a different understanding about what really living is? What if Jesus offers a different path? Then perhaps a life worth living is attainable, but not by our own efforts. But as Jesus said, as a gift. We call this gift grace in the church. So as I pointed out, our ideas of the real life, whatever that might be, revolve around us. So in a very real way, it is a selfish, self-centered vision, and our hearts are curved inward. Because of that, we break the first and greatest commandment to love God above all things. And Scripture then tells us because we break that commandment, we deserve punishment and death. But God does not desire the death of sinners. So he enters into this world in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus takes the punishment that we deserve when he dies for us on the cross. And when you contemplate that, when you study that, when you reflect on that deeply, you come to see that that is an act of great love. It's an act of love that is so great that it changes your heart and turns you away from looking at yourself. Instead, you turn outwards and look to Jesus, realizing what he has done for you. The gift of grace leads you to put Jesus at the center of your life, and then through him, you find a life that is really, truly worth 
living. How? Let me try to show you briefly. If the world seems overwhelming, Jesus says, fear not, I've overcome the world. If you're looking for meaning and purpose, you were meant to be in relationship with Jesus Christ and your purpose is to share his love with others and spread the good news of what he has done in the world. And that meaning and purpose transcends work and play and learning and whatever else that we do. And it helps us see those things with completely different eyes. And you find joy, which is different than happiness. I mean, when you know the God of this universe took on human flesh to die for you, that you no longer have to justify yourself in the sight of others, and that no matter what happens, God will bend the trajectory of life towards his good and great perfect will, there becomes a joy that rises up within and becomes unending. And you find peace. Storms may rage, but knowing that Jesus watches over you and walks with you in the storm calms your heart. And then you find hope in the midst of suffering. Jesus was not above suffering. He suffered for us, and he suffers with us. And the resurrection is the ultimate promise that all pain and suffering will be reversed and overcome. When Jesus' grace transforms you, you no longer fear the world. You have meaning and purpose. You have joy, peace, and hope. And the icing on the cake you have eternal life at the heavenly banquet. Is this not abundant life? Is this not a life that is truly worth living? And it's yours. It's yours. Because the bread of life continues to give himself to you. Thanks be to God. Amen.